Imagine a game show that dispensed with its silly feats of knowledge and puzzle solving, but instead had contestants show off their old school gaming skills for wonderful prizes like electronic toys, video game systems, and even full-sized arcade machines. Well, such a show existed, and it was called Starcade. Today we'll be taking a look at this short-lived but well-regarded show on this week's grit-kissing episode of Alice. Video games are the latest craze to sweep the country and most of the world, too. Millions of people are addicted to hours of gazing at electronic images on game screens and arcades and in their own homes. In 1981, arcade gaming was in its golden age. Game rooms were opening up everywhere and those beefy cabinets were even popping up in otherwise unrelated establishments such as supermarkets and gas stations. Revenue from these amusement devices were estimated at around $5 billion all of it earned one quarter at a time. And that figure would only climb higher in subsequent years. Video game culture was in full swing with many of the characters from these machines finding their way into other products. Producers James Caruso and Mavis E. Arthur of the JM Production Company saw an opportunity to turn this new national obsession into a weekly game show. One that would showcase the latest and greatest arcade games on which contestants would engage in fierce competition. With money out of their own pockets and rows of full-sized arcade cabinets in tow, the duo would get to work on the pilot for this new show entitled Starcade. As the duo envisioned filming this as a new type of televised sport, they hired captain of the 1980 U.S. Olympic team, Mike Urizioni, to host the competition. Vying for the grand prize would be 24 individual contestants of all ages, split into three teams of eight. Each team would all compete amongst themselves on a single game, Pac-Man, Centipede, and Defender. The winner from each team then faced each other on a game of Berserk to crown a single champion. The overall winner of that competition, David Deitch, went home with an Apple II computer system and a full-sized Asteroids Deluxe cabinet. But the best prize, he got to play a game against Chips star Larry Wilcox, just for fun, on a then brand new arcade cabinet. That game, Donkey Kong. Larry won that contest, just barely, but it didn't matter. Shooting the pilot was a technical nightmare. That impossibly large red neon Starcade sign was dealing out interference. Also, simultaneously filming and keeping track of the scores of 24 individual cabinets was no small feat. But probably one of the biggest hurdles was the talent. Mike Urizioni couldn't parlay his Miracle on Ice accomplishments into competent hosting skills, as he was constantly flubbing his lines. Like I do. Nonetheless, Caruso and Arthur were able to cobble together enough footage for a pilot which aired as a special on San Francisco's KRON on September 13, 1981. While it won its time slot and had re-aired in a few other markets, the show failed to get picked up as a regular series. Undaunted, the duo decided to revamp the format and pitch their concept in Los Angeles. It was there a local NBC affiliate suggested shooting some new pilots with Alex Trebek. Trebek, who was a veteran game show host but between gigs at the time, showed a lot of enthusiasm emceeing the proceedings. However, many station managers found little value in the product, citing the lack of audience participation and a then-common phobia of the perceived ill effects of video games. As such, the game did not find a home on the Peacock Network. However, the concept seemed like a perfect, unique addition to the then-fledgling market of cable television. Starcade was sold to Ted Turner's superstation WTBS. However, among the changes that had to be made was hiring a new host for the show. For this, they went with an unknown, Mark Richards. Mark Richards was no stranger to game shows, albeit on the other side of the podium. Richards was a contestant on six shows, including To Tell the Truth, The Dating Game, and Wheel of Fortune. He parlayed this experience into a unique seminar that taught other would-be contestants the secrets to success. Charging no fee for the sharing of his knowledge, he instead asked for 20% of any of his students' future show winnings. His unorthodox school led to numerous guest appearances on talk shows, and it was a quick stint on the Phil Donahue show where he served as MC for a mock game show during a segment that caught the attention of the Starcade producers. This is Starcade, TV's first video arcade game show, a game show for today, and here's your host, Mark Richards. The initial 13 episodes of Starcade began taping in December of 1982, with the premiere episode airing later that same month. The format that would be well known to fans was more or less in place. 
Three rounds were played, all similar. Each one started with a toss-up multiple-choice question about arcade games. Chantel! A ape. A? You say a giant ape fighting off planes? No. The winner of this had his or her choice of one of the five arcade cabinets on display. Once the game was chosen, each player had a set amount of time to rack up as many points as possible, which is added to the player's overall score. After the second round and the third when the show first started, the contestant in the lead played a quick game where they had to name four video games based on some footage. These were once again multiple choice. Is this game here Donkey Kong Jr. or Donkey Kong? Donkey Kong. Correct. Which one will it be? Buck Rogers. Buck Rogers. And that sound means you've got the mystery game. During the game, there was also a mystery cabinet. If chosen during the main game, a bonus prize was awarded. Parker Brothers Home Video Game Cartridges. The challenge awaits you, furnished by Parker Brothers. So you're a winner already, Chantel. Come on down. Let's play Buck Rogers, and here's Kevin to tell us how that game is played. Player with the highest score after all three rounds gets to play for the grand prize. Typically an arcade cabinet, but sometimes something else like a Seaberg jukebox. Taken from the remaining two games, the player once again has the set amount of time, typically 30 seconds, to beat the average score of a group of previous players. While only on a cable market with limited penetration, it still brought in respectable numbers. An additional 13 episodes was shot at which time Ted Turner met with the production team at a convention and asked that the show be produced for a daily airing in syndication. This meant that the episode order was up to 133. However, there was one major change. Mark Richards would need to be replaced. And of course, both of you have been matched up for today's program based on your game playing ability. Harry, what are you going to do with that paper? Oh, you're new Richards was by no means a terrible game show host, but he was not all that memorable either. Perhaps his biggest sin was having absolutely no care or enthusiasm for the video games. Richards did his best to feign interest, but it was evident that he was only there for the paycheck and had no desire to tell Pac-Man from Penga. Be restored into one solid piece. I doubt it. You, you I doubt it. That? Well, let's see. Voila. And Richards' lack of commentary was a bit awkward. While players may appreciate complete silence while playing the game, it does not make for compelling television. Clearly the show needed someone more committed to the format, and they found that in Jeff Edwards. Susan, what? there's something in here. Jeff Edwards was not only a veteran in the game show industry, but also an accomplished radio personality and television performer. Edwards' presence on Starcade would give it a bit more marketability. But more importantly, he actually showed interest in the burgeoning video game culture. $12,000! first offered the gig, Jeff had never played games before, but immediately immersed himself in the scene. With his learned knowledge and personal gameplay experience, he offered up valuable tips to the players, particularly high-scoring strategies that worked best given the time limit. You have four sectors. You move the dot into one of the sectors. Whatever you get is the luck of the draw, and we we'll wish you good luck. You'll have 50 seconds to do it. You all set? Yeah, I am. All right, let's get ready to play Tron. And he did quite well keeping the audience engaged with some colored commentary during the action. Showing that he was indeed following along. Try to make the yellow circle under the wall. Good move, good move. You did it. Plenty of time for another sector. Here we go. It's worth noting that Jeff was very capable of kicking your butt at a game of Sinistar, a game known for its notorious difficulty. Here's the latest video game news from the Starcade Hotline. Another improvement to Starcade made during its syndicated heyday was the addition of the Starcade Hotline. These quick segments would highlight new developments in the arcade industry or sometimes even give a peek behind the show's scenes. They were brief, but highly interesting. While most episodes showcased a small mix of arcade games, there were some that dedicated the entire show to one select game. These were usually reserved for big deal games such as Dragon's Lair, Star Wars, and Cliffhanger. To be honest, these episodes were somewhat weaker than the standard ones owing to its repetitive nature. This is Starcade. Starcade continued until 1984, with reruns airing on TBS itself until 1985. The demise of the show can be attributed to the overall waning of the video game industry following the North American crash of 1983. Starcade, as an example of a game show, had a few flaws. Explain. <laughs> Being very narrow on topic, this show obviously appealed to a very specific audience. The multiple choice trivia would sound like gibberish to anyone who's never touched a joystick. How can the player add new ships to his tax scan squadron? 
A, by destroying a special target, or B, by docking with ships floating in space. Scoring was also wildly inconsistent. There have been plenty of occasions where the final round was a foregone conclusion, as an opponent was far ahead and the trailing player picks a game that's stingy on points. Finally, unlike the large, colorful pieces you see on traditional game shows, it's very obvious these machines were not designed with television broadcasting in mind. They did do a decent job showing the gameplay and even isolating the score, but there are times when the limitations of a camera capturing the low-res arcade monitors made the action a little harder to follow, particularly games with a vertically oriented display. What I'm trying to say here is that it's very unlikely that your grandmother, with an appreciation for blockbusters, match game, or $25,000 pyramid, would find Starcade equally as enthralling. But that's okay, because Starcade was more than just a game show, and it would be wrong to dismiss it as such. At the time, the only way joystick jockeys can get wind of the latest and greatest arcade offerings was to venture out and happen upon them on the game room floor. Starcade brought the excitement of the arcade with its dazzling array of brand new cabinets as well as old favorites to the comfort of viewers' living rooms. If the competition wasn't particularly lively on any given day, at the very least you'd get a glimpse of games that would have otherwise been overlooked, perhaps even picking up a few pointers along the way to stretch out your playtime. It's very easy to see why Starcade is still highly regarded by classic arcade gaming enthusiasts. Following the cancellation of Starcade, JM Productions went right to work on another video game related show for the syndicated market. The video game premiered in September of 1984. Filmed at Six Flags Magic Mountain in Valencia, California, the show skewed darker and edgier. Two contestants were pulled from the studio audience to compete against each other on a Commodore 64 game, with the winner eligible to play one of a handful of mini-games, much like The Price is Right. One of the more impressive games was called The Maze. 25 squares were light up as it was stepped on, either white, red, or green. The player had to find the treasure, that is, the green square, by moving one square at a time without hitting the monster, which is represented by a red square. All the while, the announcer, whose face would be superimposed over the action, would taunt the player with the unmistakable growls of a nasty gastrointestinal disorder. The rest of the minigames that were rotated were about as exciting as the show's unimaginative title. You are the game stalker, okay? Now what we're going to do on that big TV screen behind you, we're going to show you a character, okay? A game character. And I want you to tell me the name of that game character. And then, I want you to tell me the game that that character comes from. You do that in the first one, you're going to get both prizes. If you don't, you get a chance for the second prize. Okay, turn around. The contestants appearing on stage would face off against each other in a final round called the Res Off. Using the same disco floor from the maze game, the players would take turns instructing the prize model to move in a certain direction. This time, 10 squares would turn red, and if she landed on one of them, the player would be shown visually de-resing from play via a tacky effect. <laughs> Poor guy. The winner of this round would then go on to the arcade challenge, which was very much like Starcade's final round. The only difference was the player had his choice of eight different machines, and the target score was picked by a flash and randomizer. Once again, a full-sized arcade machine was most often up for grabs. The video game lasted for only a year and isn't as well remembered as its predecessor. It's easy to see why. Host Greg Winfield seemed inexperienced for television, almost more like an actual Six Flags employee they pulled on stage in between his hosting duties for water shows. Daphne or Kimberly? She's Daphne. She's not Daphne. She's Kimberly. She is Daphne. <laughs> Daphne, forgive me. <laughs> more damning is the fact that the show wasn't very fun to watch. Never mind that Commodore 64 games were somewhat less enthralling than the latest greatest arcade machines, the show spent probably 80 to 90% of its runtime not playing video games. At best, maybe only asking questions about them. And while the light up grid was an interesting gameplay element, it was basically a luck based contest. Gaming skills or knowledge not required. And I don't care if you are surrounded by roller coasters, who wears a red tracksuit to a game show hosting gig? To be fair though, the video game aired during that period when North America's initial fascination with video games was long over. Sure, many were still playing due in part to the home computer revolution and clearance bin cartridges, 
And there was still some new and exciting arcade games coming out, even if there were fewer places in which to play them. But it wasn't the same. There was no more video game culture. Just another leisure time activity some revered while others ignored. And unfortunately, the video game just perpetrated the downfall of the industry with its assortment of uninteresting parlor games instead of attempting to renew interest, even if just a little bit, in any significant way. Starcade was not only an all-around stronger show, but a reminder of a happier time for arcade manufacturers, operators, and players. A time when imagination and innovation was running wild and there was always something new every time you walked into your favorite arcade. Starcade found a renewed popularity with a new generation of retro gamers when reruns aired on G4 from 2002 to 2004 prior to its merger with Tech TV. And many of the full episodes, including a lot of behind the scenes information and even some classic commercials, are available for your perusal at Starcade.tv. I recommend checking it out if you have an afternoon to spare. This was Dave for TV Games. Like, comment, subscribe, please, and thank you. See you next time.